We're back with a brand new Anatomy of a Strategy podcast. This is Carlos Pacheco. And my name is Tara Hunt. This week, we have a very special guest. I'm sort of... Can I just geek out for just a quick second? I was trying to geek out. (laughs) (laughs) All right, I'll let you do it. (laughs) No, no, you go. Well, Rand, if anybody who understands the web and Google and search is probably the god of search engine optimizers. He founded SEO Moz. He was one of the leading voices in the world of search engine marketing and search engine optimization. And I've been following him for years, 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 and I could not imagine the day that I would meet him in real life. Yeah. And not only is he whip smart, has a lot of great stories to tell, um, and that, and he's doing some pretty cool stuff with Spark Toro, his up and coming startup that he's going to be launching. He's also probably one of the nicest guys I have ever met. I really enjoyed this conversation, so I hope you enjoy it too. Welcome to <laughs> and welcome Rand Fishkin. Um, We are so excited to be sitting here uh, with you. And for those of you who are listening, which I probably think like maybe 1% of the people that are listening have not heard of you, (laughs) could you introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Well, Tara Carlos, thank you so much for having (laughs) me. Yeah, so I uh, started a company called Moz in Seattle, Washington in the States. Uh, It's a software startup. Uh, When I started it, it was just me and my mom, and we were a uh, web marketing consulting business, and then transitioned into sort of being SEO, and uh, then built some software. And now today, Moz is a venture-backed startup with a couple hundred employees, uh, maybe 30, 35,000 customers, around 55 million in revenue, um, growing, but slow growing for a venture backed company. Uh, and, Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, I was the, the founder and CEO of that company for a long time, uh, stepped down as CEO about four years ago, four or five years ago and, uh, left about a year ago. And now I, I started a new company called spark Toro, uh, which is focused on audience intelligence software, uh, wrote and published a book called lost and founder and yeah, do a lot of speaking and travel, those kinds of things and eat a lot of pasta. (laughs) <laughs> oh, have you what been to, yeah. what was it, Pag, Pagliacci? Or what was the, what was the, I anyways, yeah, there was an amazing. I saw a recommendation for a restaurant called Pagliacci's. Yes. That's here amazing. Here in we just went Victoria. Go. 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 It's really weird because we have a low priced, crappy fast food pizza, pizza chain in Seattle called Pagliacci. Uh-huh. I looked it up and I was like, why am I yeah, what, getting it, it referred doesn't to this make Seattle sense. Place. Like, yeah, no. Okay. So apparently this place yes, is not that. Yeah. And it's actually really, um, like it's got a beautiful mood. It feels like, um, you're Family. in your family's kitchen Cute. and the I, I had the seafood bouillabaisse, base, I guess that like blew my mind. It was amazing. So awesome. anyways, All right. restaurant recommendations, you yes. heard it here first. Yes. Uh, but one of the things that you said in your intro, which I absolutely made me absolutely adore you is that the way that you describe the stuff that you've done, which for a lot of people watching you build Moz, which by the way, we're, we're customers of oh, as very well. Oh, cool. Awesome. Uh, we just sold Moz Local to our cannabis client. Nice. <laughs> well. yeah. it's, because, a, it's, a, it's a good product. It's, it's yeah. nice because it's just um, sort of does all the things that you needed mm-hmm. to do, but is much lower price than... Yeah, cause which, so yeah, uh, Moz Local was actually the brainchild of a friend of ours, David Mim, down in Portland, awesome. who had built this, you know, this service uh, to get all of his, his customers and clients listed and was like, God, this is such a pain. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, David and I had known each other for many years and I was like, you're building something awesome. Can we acquire you and sort of build this out as Moz Local? And yeah, it's amazing. So very cool well, you've done all this amazing stuff and it's no small feat. I know this personally to build a product, especially yeah. coming from a services based <laughs> uh, background. Well, so don't, don't sell yourself short. I mean, I think that services, services based products are very challenging to build as well yeah. yes. and targeting those correctly and making them, you know, have the right margins and all that. Uh, you know, getting the right people behind it and then being able to scale that, that, that is incredibly hard. I, I think one of the reasons that I was successful at software is because I sucked at consulting. 
<laughs> and I don't, I don't mean that in terms of like, like I sucked, like I was bad at giving the advice. I mean, I was bad at building a consulting business. Right. Like I could never extricate myself from the process. Is I anybody never... really good at building a consulting business? I guess it depends on what you mean by business. But yeah, I think there are. So I, um, I have lots of friends who I think are extraordinary builders of consulting businesses. Um, you know, I think that Chris Bennett and the folks at 97th Floor have done an amazing job. Ross Hudgens down in San Diego. Um, with Siege Media, Will Reynolds. I mean, has built an extraordinary. Oh. I, I wrote about the the CEO swap that I did. Oh yeah, yeah that's in, right. Uh, Lost and Founder. That was with Will. Yeah. Right. Where so I was sort of I was CEO was of this really cool. consulting business, yeah. right? SEO consulting business for a week, <laughs> which is, sounds insane. And yeah, he was yeah. the CEO of Moz for a week, and we traded email addresses and we traded yeah. lives and homes and all that stuff. But and that's yeah. an amazing story. And I loved hearing your side. I would love to hear his side. Did he write oh, about you, it anywhere? You should. I, you should get him on the podcast. Yeah. I'll make an Absolutely. introduction yeah, and, and you should get him on here. I mean, I, he is also a brilliant marketing thinker, very, very tactically deep in sort of SEO and big data. But um, yeah. yeah, so for those of you who have not potentially listened to Lost and Founder yet and don't Red. know a, a li- well, we listen. You can do either one. Yeah, yeah. Rad, listen to Lost and Founder. Um, there is an amazing story uh, where Rand does this whole like in life swap for <laughs> a week um, and takes over somebody else's business, like full on. Yeah, like, oh, yeah. you it's were hard, right. A little bit. It's sort of yeah, sort of I, I guess that's right? correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you Sear, learned their needs. That's right. Yeah. Right? Sear was using Mazda's software yes. uh, at the yeah. time, and I sort of went in and, and took a look and um, realized how people were using it yes. and what they needed. It's yes. you know, it's re- I I was listening to that and I thought it's that's so brilliant. I wish you know there actually might be a business model service in that <laughs> sort of swapping, like where you would mm-hmm. as a founder startup startup founder or something that is serving a market be able to swap with one of your you know, I mean I'm excited customers. I'm excited for someday in the future when Spark Toro is big enough and Will and I can do it again. I think that'll yeah, be really yeah. fun. Yeah. Well, come do it with us. Too. <laughs> yeah, like I loved the stories that you had in well, Lost you. and Founder. It was what was really like what really drew me and what really I really appreciated was you talking about being a founder from such a honest human. uh human perspective and like laying it all out there like blood and guts up out <laughs> on the table um but in a way that uh like i just kept saying oh my god i've been there i understand and i'm pretty sure that a lot of people that are buying the book and uh tweeting at you that they're loving the book are having those same moments um, it's just, it was amazing. Uh, but one of the pieces that I especially love because it's directly related to what we do in the st- strategy world is you addressed one of my biggest pet peeves, which is growth hacking. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and can you talk a little bit about your experience with growth hacking and where you came out on the other side of that? Yeah, I mean, I think thankfully, right now we're finally at the at the end of that phase. Like I'm seeing, even in Silicon Valley startups, you know, the the, the growth marketers, the growth hackers are changing their titles. They're saying, "Oh no, wait! I I do I do growth marketing. I do marketing. I'm the director of marketing. I'm the VP of marketing, as opposed to I'm a growth hacker." Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that it has acquired this more negative reputation, and that is because. It is such a short-term practice. So the experience that I had at Moz, which I talked about in Lost and Founder, was essentially that we'd chase a growth growth hack, we'd find one that sort of, oh man, this really moved the needle for us, and then we'd keep trying to juice it, and Mm -hmm. the second time you do it, the third time, the fourth time, it it just falls in value and falls in uh, success rate and um, eventually burns out, as opposed to putting those same efforts of discovery and testing and iteration into a flywheel, right? Something that uh, scales with decreasing friction, Mm -hmm. something that you can do over and over again and will keep producing results and hopefully more results than it did last time. You know, podcasting is a great example of that. Hopefully many people will listen to this podcast and they will enjoy it and they will share it with their 
friends and coworkers and people in their networks. Mm -hmm. And then the next time you produce a podcast, you will have more listeners and that will give you more surface area to distribute to even more listeners in the future. And so every time you're doing the same amount of work, but getting more and more out of it, mm -hmm. that's exactly what a flywheel is meant to build. A growth hack is sort of the opposite. Right. You know, you find this thing, you abuse it, it's often slightly unethical to very unethical. It's often skirting around laws. Um, and now there's much more strict privacy protection, email spam compliance, you know, uh, web marketing laws than there ever have been. Influencer marketing has way more laws than it used to, all these kinds of things. Yeah. And, uh, and so you're often walking that tightrope in addition to uh, dealing with the fact that most growth hacks fail and, yeah. and all of them fail eventually. Yeah. Right. Uh, I love the, I don't know if you've ever seen Andrew Chen's blog post. He's a Silicon Valley sort of marketing guy, but um, he writes about the law of shitty click through rates. <laughs> <laughs> and the law is pr pretty simple. Basically, any tactic that begins uh, with high reach and high um, and, and sort of, yeah, high impressions, engagement. low abuse, yeah. high engagement will eventually get to this dark place where everyone is used to it. So, do you? Yeah. Um, my, my favorite recent example is, you know, the negative opt-out popover overlays, mm -hmm. right? Like you get to, not to call him out, but you get to Neil Patel's website, yeah. for example, <laughs> right? And, you know, and it... Oh, and they're shaming. And, right, and there's so much shaming. It is, you know, it's either, uh, do you want to be the best marketer you, that you can possibly be by joining yeah. Neil Patel's email list? Or it's like, no, I'm a worthless human being yeah, and no one much. will ever love me. <laughs> yeah. Pretty right, much, and you have yeah. you have to click. No, I'm a worthless human being in order to get it yeah. to go away. Right, and this that tactic, that growth hack, was super effective for a very little while. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then it you know then it died on the vine, right? And so now now Neil Patel has this thing where like when you click on his site, there's like these sort of slide overs that that overlay things, and you have to get through them before you can see the content. But so different style, still a growth hack. I'm sure it will yeah. also fade in value. But it's that, that growth hack chasing yeah. that you're constantly on and you have to find the next one, find the next one. Well, and I think the biggest problem here, and you talked about it in the book, definitely, in, and definitely this morning in your talk at Social Media Camp. That's why we're here in Victoria. Uh, shout out to the awesome team that put that yeah, together. Yeah, it's been a lovely event. Yeah, so this actually leads to the downfall of marketing, right? You talk about the four horsemen of of uh, the uh, marketing apocalypse. Yeah. Um, and you can go into that in just a bit. But what I see is like, the more people try to hack things, the more people cheat and take these shortcuts, the more that customers end up putting their like guard up and getting kind of immune to any sort yeah, any of... Any given tactic. You know, like it now you don't even want to click through on things yeah. because you're worried about some like this. I've seen these new things and I hate them. It's the, the pop-up that comes out. Like we'd like to send you notifications. Yeah. Um, I, I, I never want any notification from any website. Exactly. And if I do, I'll subscribe to your RSS. Thank you yeah. very much. And I, I've like, accidentally clicked on oh. it and then you have to go into your browser yeah. settings and now so now i've started to actually put blockers on everything now marketers can't see anything that so i'm this doing is, yeah a great site. example of sort of the growth hacking world versus right the organic mm -hmm. attention building mm -hmm. that can come from creating a great flywheel that scales with decreasing friction so let's talk about that flywheel a little bit mm -hmm. i love this metaphor so much because it puts a beautiful like visualization to something that I've had a very difficult time like describing to clients yeah. because quite a, especially now after many years of growth hacking and, and and efficiency sort of driving kind of marketing tactics short termism yeah to go to a potential client and go well you're not going to get results Right, Early right. on, it, it's going to be hard work and it may be pretty expensive. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, you got to trust me on this. <laughs> We're going mean, to get think, into this. I think the nice part is like they don't they don't necessarily have to just trust you, right? They can look out in the field right. and see that their competitors and the, the people who've been successful with marketing, who've built great audiences that have high engagement, that pay attention, that that click, that convert that those people's attention has been earned through a flywheel that usually takes 
years. Yeah. So I, to, so I, describe. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, but I I always bring the example of so for the past six to seven years, I my focus has been uh, audience development in, on the YouTube ecosystem. Yeah. So before it turned into like influencer crap, right? But my my sort of like advice to anybody sort of getting into the space, I would say like expect three years of creating content and you know like doing stuff right and consistency and it's like it's that little ecosystem that's just there right you can just use that example uh, it's always been it's always been the thing with seo uh, right th this has always been true in the world of blogging yeah. it has always been true in the world of be building a career as a as a speaker yeah. it's been true in the world of building a podcast yeah. it's been true in the world of building uh, a magazine or published content real radio influence. show yeah right like the, these things there is no overnight success mm -hmm. there's only Gosh, you know, this person's an overnight success. What have they been doing the last seven years? <laughs> well, this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> How strange is that? Gosh, what a coincidence it must be that they overnight got big. Yeah, yeah. But, the, you know, the big issue is that, um, like, I've been doing this for 20 years now. And from, I mean, early in my career, there was... There was SE, well, sort of SEO. Yeah, yeah, sure. Ish Late stuff. 90s, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, there was like flash websites and whatever else. Sorry. That's what, there I, wasn't, yeah. I there built were, a bunch of those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know. Those like, those home pages that you came to and you had to watch some sort of weird thing. Anyways, so that, there was that, but there wasn't a lot of the sort of the social um, right. underpinning. And at that time, we were saying, Invest in, you know, great content. Don't just build a brochure website. Invest in good content on your website and you'll place higher on these search engines. And sure, there are like little tips and tricks that you could do. I'd, I'd go to the like SEO, whatever the early conferences were, and they sure. would talk about how you um, – use the and they're illegal now like the tagging and stuff like that of uh, yeah backlinking all that stuff sure. but in general it was always about building really useful content that people were looking for um, but people would still at that point be like how can I cheat the system yep and then social came along and you were like okay well social this is great engage this is a great opportunity to learn from your audience to listen to to improve your products, to improve how you speak with your audience, to understand them in a way that, you know, I think there's a Peter Drucker quote that I always use is like, good marketing is about understanding your audience so much that you don't even have to sell anything to them. You're like, they find you and they're like, mm. this is what I've been looking for all my life. And so we said, you need to invest in that into listening. And they ignored it and said, no, how can we like buy ads? How can we do, how can we push a message? Yeah. Push a message. How can we like do something that's like hacking it or whatever? And then now, you know, it just keeps going. And I thought for the 20 years I've been preaching this, if you would have just invested early on, you would yeah. be so far ahead. Yeah. Do you think yeah. that's going to change? No, I don't think that. I, I don't think that. <laughs> People can uh, be lazy forever. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think that there's just a, a natural human tendency to look for shortcuts and to be attracted to uh, short-term solutions. And that, to be honest, it's kind of a good thing. Hmm. Because if you are one of the few people who's willing to make that long-term investment, you stand out from the crowd. Same. Right? If everybody did it, if everybody did this effective, you know, flywheel, invest for the long term, the competition would be goddamn fierce. Mm -hmm. It would be insane. It would be so hard to stand out. Instead, there are a ton of people who look for the short-term hack and abuse that, and therefore, there's lots of opportunity in being in it for the long haul and Absolutely. building an audience slowly but surely. So, because people can't see the flywheel, I'm sure they're going to go and they're going to Google it. The people we'll that... Put it in the show notes. We'll, we'll put it in the show notes, but Somebody might be in there. Hello, if you're in your car, yeah. you know, we're, yeah, can yeah, you no, describe it's, it's, it like easy to visualize, right? Yeah. So this, it, a flywheel is essentially this um, energy storing device from the industrial age. It's a giant contraption. It basically looks like a wagon wheel, giant metal or iron uh, wagon wheel. And the idea was, I, th I think there might even still be a few in existence somewhere mm -hmm. that are that are still used. But the idea is that in order to get this large mechanical flywheel, uh, uh, you know, wagon wheel, mm -hmm. and we're talking like, you know, the height of 20 people, giant, giant thing. In order to get it spinning, 
you have to put in an extraordinary amount of energy, right? right? Like it takes a ton of electricity or whatever kind of energy you're generating to get this thing started. But once it revolves two or three or four times around, every successive spin of that wheel gets easier and easier. No surprise, because it's operating on inertia. Most of the energy that you're putting into it is just pushing that inertia forward. And this is the same principle by which a marketing flywheel operates, that initially the first few weeks, months, years take a ton of effort and energy. You're building your new podcast, you're building your new YouTube channel, you're building your new blog out, you're building your new article series, your new series of comic drawings that go on Instagram, your new photography, whatever kind of content you're creating or, or advertising, right? There are lots of other forms of marketing that are not necessarily just content-based. PR, uh, flywheels exist. Uh, um, I talked about today a little bit, the events flywheel, mm -hmm. right? Where you go to conferences and build up your flywheel that way. So as you're doing that, each successive revolution becomes slightly easier. And so you get out uh, more than you're putting in over time. But you, you got you to gotta stick through those yeah. first few mm -hmm. challenging years. And I think the first few challenging years is, um, is it's a hard sell. Yeah. Especially to clients, right? Because mm -hmm. I think when clients come to an agency, to a consultant, they are typically desperate. Right. Mm -hmm. they, it, it, the, yes. you, what you don't find a lot. I mean, sometimes you will find it, but you don't find a lot as a client who says we have a lot of patience and a healthy <laughs> and a healthy budget for this. Uh, and we know that this investment is going to take a long time. Tell us where to get started and, uh, you know, how to proceed. Mm -hmm. Instead, they come to you, oh, my God, we need to make everything is burning down. If we don't make our quarter, you know, mm -hmm. quarterly results, how do we get, you know, this much traffic? How do we get this many conversions? Uh, what are your guarantees? <laughs> like, that's the big thing is Ooh. like, can you get these guys said that they can guarantee me this? I was like, uh, go with those guys because yep. they're they're going to fall right, on their they'll, face. They'll, I don't. I don't want to be set up to fail. No, no, I'll no. let them do it over there. Yeah, I think uh, it, it's been really interesting to see. Like, I whenever someone asks, "Hey, can you refer me to an agency?" I, I don't do any, any consulting work myself, and haven't for a decade now. But whenever folks ask me to refer them to an agency or consultant, you know, if if they say, "Hey, we're looking for someone who offers guaranteed results," my reply is always, "Well, just go to Google." Yeah. Uh, yeah. Find whatever's on the front page, and good luck to you. Mm -hmm. When that fails, email me again, and I'll ping my network and find you someone good. Yeah. Right. Because nobody who is worth any uh, uh, value in the marketing space it's offers guarantee. guarantees yeah. results. Even people who do it for a little bit amount of time, they quickly realize, oh, this is this is the path to death. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. No success at all. Speaking of path to death, <laughs> Spark Toro, tell us, that's not, that's not exactly what I meant to do oh, there. Yeah, oh, no, no. Spark Toro, when I saw that you were speaking here, I hadn't heard that you were on a new project. I, oh, I thought you yeah, were, yeah, yeah. I, I knew that you had, yeah, yeah, sure. I knew you had left, but I, I, I didn't know. I only left about a year ago. Yeah. yeah, but I didn't know that you, you know, were starting something new. And um, when I saw, I clicked through and looked at Spark Toro, I think I, yelled some expletives out loud like <laughs> holy rah, 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 rah. i can't say it on the podcast but i was like this is exactly what we need oh cool when we get a new client and we we sort of sell them on the idea of like research yeah. deep research to understand the audience like it's, to design six, a better it's strategy. six weeks of like you know her into it like tools staff and like it's it's a big undertaking right sure and and it's like the tools for that is have been like sort of rudimentary if not like you know not that yeah. great and the ones that are really good are really expensive sure like we for crimson hexagon we spend over thirty thousand. yeah year. yeah it's very expensive and it doesn't always work for every project that sure. we're working on so um i just was really excited because you're all of these tools tend to do a little bit of what we're looking for, but you with Spark Toro seemed to like, it was like you got inside my brain and you were like, oh, that's what people need. And now I'm going to build it. <laughs> I won't do it justice, but I'm just going to quickly say that what I saw when I saw it, Spark Toro, and you can tell me if I got this right and then correct me, sure. is a platform where I can see who is 
interested and in kind of like not in market, but interested in subject matters, not just on the Instagram and uh, Twitter's sort of like sphere, but also in general, like um, what podcasts they're listening to, what um, websites, websites they're visiting, they're visiting all this stuff. Yeah. So, so that I can understand how that person is, is kind of con- looking for more information on that subject. And, you know, we talked earlier about uh, like we had done a recent study for a cannabis client on this, you know, moving a, can a curious uh, consumer to actually being like a, a full on kind of consumer and what they're where they're going. And we had to do very manual work to find out where they're going for their information, like what kind of content is bringing them through that permissioning journey. Yep. Um, and then, uh, you know, you just like brought up your little test screen and showed me like boop, right there. I was like, I took what? 30 hours to sort of build yeah, that list. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is exactly the problem that we're seeing. So I, um, uh, uh, my wife and I are small investors in a, you know, a number of startups. We invested in Techstars Seattle, which is like a, an accelerated program, yeah. and, and Tiny Seed Fund, which um, is an emerging sort of alternative to venture capital. Um, we invest in Backstage Capital, which, which funds a bunch of underrepresented um, and, and diverse founders, primarily black women founders. Oh, cool. Amazing. And uh, as I helped startups, right, which was something I did sort of, especially my last few years at Moz uh, and this past year too, I, I kept seeing the same problem over and over, which is this, um, hey, w- while we're doing our audience research, right, figuring out who our customer is and all that, we try and figure out where they pay attention and yeah. to whom and to what. Mm-hmm. So we want to know what events and conferences do they go to? Which yep. podcasts do they listen to? Mm-hmm. Who do they follow on all of the different social networks? What websites and blogs and publications do they read and pay attention to and engage with? And just answering those four questions yeah. could be, to your point, tens, dozens of hours of work that often involved either very manual research, which couldn't be at scale enough to be accurate, or it involved uh, surveys and audience interviews which expensive. also, yeah, very expensive, incredibly time consuming. And you have to make sure that you nail the audience that you survey and your survey design. Mm-hmm. And so we were seeing that companies were paying twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for essentially a PR firm uh, or, or an influence Center, firm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Consulting firm yeah. to perform these, these surveys. And we thought, this is crazy. It's 2019. How is there not, you know, all this data is public on the internet. There's mm-hmm. so many public profiles. In an election, you don't have to survey, you know, every person in Canada to see what percentage support, you know, this prime minister candidate or that prime minister candidate. Mm-hmm. You can survey less than a tenth of a percent and get a, a, a good yeah. reading, right? Yeah. Through sample sizing, right? This is how statistics work. So we thought, gosh, there's enough people on the internet who are publicly putting out their data of mm-hmm. what they share, follow, listen to, link to, tweet about, put on Facebook, uh, put on Instagram, put on uh, their personal website, put on their LinkedIn, put on their YouTube page, right? All this stuff, all of that is public. If we crawl these and connect up these profiles correctly, uh, we can then give accurate data about any group of audience that you want to search for. And so that's exactly what the what the product's designed to do. And so it's it's really around interest based then like what they're interested in and then you or is there uh, other so we have dimensions? so we have sort of four ways that you can search right now. It's possible that when we launch we'll have more but um, and just to be clear for anyone listening this product does not exist yet. It yeah. is not live. What I showed Tara yes. is an alpha version that <laughs> only my co-founder and I have access to. No, it's I very, very nascent. We were itching to. Yeah. And we won't rush you because we read about that in lots of <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I, I like building polished products. Yeah. But um, so, so basic story is that, you know, you can search by uh, a group of people who frequently talk about or are interested in something, meaning for example, like, oh, lots of these profiles, lots of these individuals s- use the word cannabis right. or related words, um, words that mean the same thing. Or we want people who have this word or phrase in their bio. 
Right. They're a pharmacist. They're a plumber. They're an electrician. They're a yoga instructor. They're a, you know, um, uh, an architect, whatever it is, right? That you can search for those types of people. You can search by people who follow a social account. Oh, so you can say, yeah, yeah. I can't really describe my audience in a few mm-hmm. words, but I know that lots of them like blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And so you can search by follows, you know, this person on Twitter or that Twitter account. Or the fourth one is reads the website, visits the website. So if you know that a lot of your customers are already visiting, you could plug in your own website if you wanted right. to get data mm-hmm. about your audience, or you could plug in a competitor's website if they're sort of bigger than you, they attract an audience. So you want to see like, hey, we know that they all pay attention to this. Let's see all the data about their, you know, the audience that pays right. attention to this. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, essentially there's a few tabs. There's one that will show you the websites they visit and link to and pay attention to, the social accounts they share and engage with uh, and follow, the podcasts that they listen to, uh, and then a bunch of what we call um, audience intelligence attributes. Mm-hmm. So these are things like what words and phrases do they frequently use in their bio? Mm-hmm. Are they a very homogenous or very diverse audience? Meaning do they have, do they tend like this, everyone who's an architect follows these three publications right. mm-hmm. or people who are architects have a widely diverse range of things that they fall and pay attention to. Mm-hmm. Um, we show geographic distributions of the mm-hmm. audience. So like, oh gosh, that weirdly for the population size, there's a lot of these people in Vancouver or Victoria right. or whatever it is. Um, so all, all kinds of data like that, that you would get through this surveying and research process yeah. that hopefully can just be at your fingertips so that you, you are not gonna get um, perfect results from this or from any process, right. but this can give you much wider range of data. And we'll actually say how many profiles you're getting the data from. So you can show to a client like, hey, SparkToro has 18,000 uh, people who are interested in cannabis in British Columbia, and here's what they pay attention to. Right. Yeah, and so like when we look, use these tools, we never just use these tools and spit out a report. Right. And I don't yeah. know anybody who really like does that as per se. You, I've seen some people do it with Moz, uh, but really? <laughs> they'll just like print out the crawl report and be like, here, fix this. Wow. Well, <laughs> Which is I mean, all right. this is, that's yeah. fine well, for I that. Know. Yeah. But for, <laughs> but when we're bringing like insights to build a strategy on top of it, yeah, what, what we're looking for are those like through the jungle, this clear pathway to finding those insights that you need to go that is going to be the exact audience that we should be talking with. This is what we need to, how we need to approach them and where we need to approach them. And like, um, you know, that's the sort of stuff that we would be looking more, you know, manually at, yeah. but at least we're not dealing with the full jungle at that point. It's like a little path through the jungle that we're looking at. Well, and I, you know, I think a, a big part of my motivation behind Spark Toro is, is seeing that, you know, if you're a big company, you can afford to do this research every quarter. You can have it tracked over time. You can have detailed information about it. Uh, 50 grand is a drop in the bucket to you. You don't care. If you're a small company, you're trying to compete. You're a, you're a new company, you're trying to compete. You're a small business you know, uh, in a local region. You, you just cannot afford to do this, this type of research. And that feels fundamentally unfair to me, right? And, yeah, and, and usually they end up, they end up using like the, the Facebook. You know, sort right. of analytics, right? And say, yeah. oh, that's our audience. And like, no. No, <laughs> no. Yeah, you can't go to, yeah, you go to Facebook analytics or Twitter yeah. analytics. Yeah. And it's like, that's not, oh my God. Okay. You, well, the uh, audience insights uh, screen yeah, on Facebook, on Facebook. Is, is actually pretty cool. It doesn't tell the, I mean, of course, it doesn't tell yeah. the whole story, but there are some insights there to that might go, oh, interesting. So people who, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, who are into skincare, are also into traveling to the beach, you know, because they're following Sunwing holidays, right? Like, so you kind of like, oh, there's something there. Now we can start to build a profile, but it's not, okay, this is the answer. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, to your point, right? There's any of these tools, it it is, you can extract some intelligence from. Um, My challenge is always like, why does this exist, right? And with Facebook, Audience Insights exists, to sell you more Facebook advertising. Oh, yeah. yes. So, uh, I mean, everything I don't Facebook think exists to sell, sell you more advertising. <laughs> that's well, exactly right. So, <laughs> like, I got, I t- during your talk today, I just tweeted the whole, like, you know, every single time, I mean, I've been in the industry for like, you know, 
since SEO started. And it's like every single time Facebook or Google reaches out to you, it's not that. And they say, let's help you with your campaign. Oh, my God. It's, it's always to help you spend it's more a whole, money. It's like, oh, well, let's let's spend more money. Hi, and Carlos. Then, we'd like to help us with our quarterly earnings. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have time to talk? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, actually, I've gotten really very obsessed uh, with the segmenting in on um, the audience side of Google Analytics oh, sure. recently. Yeah. So uh, we're like testing out more broad, broad terms with narrow audiences. So mm-hmm. in market segments and stuff like that to see like how we can uh, <laughs> can drive that. I've gotten like so super obsessed with that because I just feel like we're getting to a place where people are showing their tastes even even more online. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in though what happens next with the privacy stuff that is coming down the pipe. I mean, that's a lot of data that you're. Oh, so I mean, the nice thing for us is we throw away or uh, don't use, don't show like any PII, right? So okay. we'll we won't say, for example, oh, here are um, whatever it is, thirteen thousand plumbers in BC. Right. We. We don't have their names. You can't see who they are. Or, you know, like that. That that data is not uh, available mm-hmm. uh, to us. It's not available publicly, right? It, it we're uh, aggregating and anonymizing, right? So we only care. But these are the, yeah. The, 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 here are the words in the bio. So this is just you know profile one seven four two three a to us, right? And here's all the attributes about the profile. Uh, if you looked at that individual profile, you might have some concern like, ooh, I might be able to figure out who that is. But you'll never see that profile. You'll right. only ever see an aggregation of that profile and 700 others with the percentage of the profiles that used some word or followed some account or visited right. some website, mm-hmm. those kinds of things. Yeah, but you still have, uh, and and it's people that are public. That, that's exactly that's right. The yeah, that's the other data that you can pull. Is we only pull, old. yeah, so... At, Nothing that we have is something that Google wouldn't already be storing and showing. Now, the one part, though, that like triggered that question was when you were talking about people that were visiting websites. Yeah. And when I say visit, I should be careful about that. It is an implied (laughs) visit. So we assume that if you uh, share or if you follow an account on social, you probably also visit a web that website. Mm -hmm. Uh, We imply or something from the Yep, we imply that if you share an article or if you link to an article from your profile page, you probably have visited that website. Do not like cooking, like like buying cookie data or anything. uh, We do buy clickstream data from Jumpshot, but that is only for aggregate. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, that's just telling us how popular a website is broadly yeah. so that we can, if somebody says like, I only want to see the very unpopular websites that are visited by plumbers in BC, not, you know, don't show me, it's not going to be Fox news, but yeah, don't yeah. show me, you know, like the, do- the cbc.ca, right? Like I don't want to see that. Yeah. Like everybody, like the, well, you gave the example of Trump, right? So what I find is, is problematic in almost all of these aggregate data sources like Crimson or sure. Finio or any of them, DigiMind is like, they always have those. Why? Why don't they have big, a, we like, have a little slider, like even in our alpha version, we have yeah. a little slider where it's like exclude popular accounts and results. I don't know why they don't. Mm-hmm. And do so that. we just take out the top like 50 or whatever it is. And that always removes, you know, whatever yeah. Trump, Kardashian, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Should, yeah. No, well, I know. Badness. I know. Right. I know. There's a whole bunch of things that are bad. We should complain to them. <laughs> well, also. <laughs> if I, Casey and I can build it. Yeah. <laughs> they can definitely build it. Yeah, well, I mean, I also think that you just by your nature are closer to the audience than a lot of people that are building these products. Like I'm you sure, have yeah. spent a lot more time understanding your market. Um, I mean, my hope is maybe they maybe they have brands who like really want that top level data, right? They want to know to what degree does our audience talk about Donald Trump. Yeah, I would I don't imagine know. that even for those brands they'd get a little tired after a while be like, okay, he's in every search, can we just find a way yeah, to yeah, yeah. move? I can't imagine why they wouldn't want the filter. Yeah, yeah. Cuz the the toggle is sometimes useful. We, I, I had an example where I was searching, oh, I was looking at um, economists. I was talking to someone at a conference about their, you know, they they work for a publisher who tries to reach professional economists. 
and some research economists and, and sort of um, academic ones too. But we were looking at the Sparktoro results and we're like, gosh, it's it's really weird that Paul Krugman isn't in here, right? Like he's sort of the best right. known economist, at least in the United States. And uh, and then, yeah, sure enough, when we toggled off the high popular accounts, he's so popular mm. with even non-economists wow. that he was in the like top yeah. 50 most followed by everybody. And hence we had excluded him. So yes, I can see why sometimes, you know, you do want to have that but like even just to have the slider to see yeah, what that you looks want like. That. You want well, that I know slider. like we use clear a lot. Yeah. Um, and they do have a, you can do a like top. Include, you know, exclude, exclude, yeah. Exclude, which is really great. And I love uh, Guy um, and what they've done yeah. at uh, Clear. I've been a big fan of theirs forever. Speaking of Clear and speaking of like just like us being your future customer with Spark Toro. <laughs> Please don't make us sign up for a full year at a time. <laughs> yeah, I think we, so we talked about, uh, I think we actually want to do something weird because we, we had realized in a bunch of our customer research that there are a large number of people who do this type of research like once a year. Mm -hmm. Like they don't, they, they think about it maybe once every year or two and, and they just don't do it. So I think we're actually going to try and have one-time use pricing. Amazing. Amazing. Like you can have... Because then you could charge it back to clients. Yeah, exactly too, right. right. So, so we can basically just say, oh, okay, you know, it's whatever monthly. I think these were some of the numbers we were writing on the whiteboard, and we haven't done all our price research work yet, which is another. That's another big challenge. I don't know if you've ever done pricing research, oh, but yeah. yeah, it's it's really it's an interesting pseudoscience. I mean, it's science and pseudoscience. There's so much psychology in there, but um, we were basically like, oh, okay, so if the you know, whatever standard account access is a couple hundred bucks a month and, you know, top tier access is like 500 a month. We might have something where for one week you can get top tier level access, uh, run all your reports or whatever for like 300 bucks or 350. And then, yeah. Charge yeah, I mean, and even if you charge a premium on that one time. Right. The one time is more than, more than a month. A month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But not but you're just but it's unlimited and oh, like and unlimited. then you're not and you're not locked in anyway. Yep. What's nice about that and this is what I've tried to tell Crimson and Affinio and everybody else that I've, you know, yeah, looked at their tools and used their cancel one because of that. Yeah, yeah, it's like well if we I'm happy to pay a premium and then what I can do is I can charge that back to the client. When I'm paying a monthly fee, I can't put that on my client's right, bill because there's right. no specific invoice or yes. a yearly fee there's no specific invoice for super, their part super smart. I, so uh i wanted to do this at moz and the the challenge was um it's very this is an odd thing to say but um to a venture-backed firm that revenue is useless hmm. wow it's just useless revenue right like it doesn't Technically, it's dollars, it's not but because it is not recurring, right. yeah. it doesn't show on your, hey, what is your recurring revenue? What's your MRR? What's your ARR? Right. Those are the only metrics that your investors and the investors who will eventually buy them out in the public markets or when, you know, when the company is acquired, which is the goal of, of every venture-backed business, they won't care either, right? But that's how every business works. If you think beyond, of course, the software subscription model is that... You know, a, a boutique that sells jackets, right? Like they know they can, after a few years of data, they know how often customers will come back in and what the average purchase is. And they understand, right. they can even understand their customer lifetime value from that sort of. But this is short term money seeking right. short term returns, right? Well, ah, I, I short termism, think, it's like the yeah, whole vein to all of our existence. coming Coming back <laughs> around, right? Uh, but, but yeah, this, yeah. I think this is the. Uh, fundamental challenge and so when are we i know that we once again we don't want to put a whole bunch of pressure on you <laughs> speaking of short-termism we can't wait to get into uh, spark Tara, but when when are you like looking to i mean our hope is that we will actually be able to launch this summer okay so we're awesome. not yeah we're not super testers. far oh i really appreciate it yeah yeah no we have a we have a beta sign up on our product page and i oh, think so. i oh, think we're we're probably Gosh, I think people. we're <laughs> only six to eight weeks away from being able to wow. start doing a beta test. So yeah, our plan is basically like start releasing that to a bunch of folks. We'll probably send out a survey to a lot of that uh, email audience and like see, oh, who are people? And then, okay, well, we, we know that we're good at helping whoever it is, you know, content marketers or PRs or, yeah. um, 
you know, we're, we're less good at helping on that advertising side yet. And so we'll, we'll start with some groups or another and then, yeah, try and get feedback from those folks and see where that takes us. I think if the feedback is good, we'll probably launch real early. And if the feedback is, oh, this is interesting, but I'm not sure I'd use it very much. And I wish it did this and this and this. We'll probably, we will go and build this and this and this before we release. Did you raise money for this? I did. Uh, Yeah, yeah. Um, So Casey and I, we chose a very unusual structure. So we are not venture backed. Okay. Um, we have 35 investors, all of whom are individual people, just sort of, um, mostly friends and, um, family. uh, no family, yeah. but, um, friends and sort of colleagues from the professional world who were also excited about a business that is not following the traditional venture structure. You know, we, um, is that closed now or can, and, 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 so, uh, <laughs> Hilariously, it, <laughs> it is closed. If it were open, it would be illegal for me to tell you about it. Oh, interesting. Are we winking? <laughs> <laughs> well, because the in the United States, right. the SEC regulates right. what are called public offerings, right? Oh. Where you say like you can't hey, you have to be a registered investor. Right? Yeah, you you can't. Well, you can't uh, publicly announce that you are raising around. Hmm. You can't say that publicly on the air. I could email you and say, hey, Tara, we're raising oh, okay, around. Okay. Would you be interested? Da, 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 da. But if I sent a tweet, for example, Elon Musk style, if I oh, sent yeah. a tweet, boom, the SEC could basically crack down and say that's illegal. They could do that oh. 10 years in the future right. and you know, shut, shut us down, fine us a bunch. Right. And unlike Facebook, I don't have $5 billion sitting in my <laughs> pocket who my investors are excited about me paying a fine <laughs> to uh, the government for. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah. yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. We're, we're I love Kara Swisher's like oh, Adam. Oh, I know she's amazing. My God, yeah. Keep going, Kara. I, I love that. What was it? Uh, add a zero, then maybe we'll talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Good. yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. This is awesome. Oh yeah. gosh, yeah, my pleasure. And thank you for having me. If if you want, if you're not already following Rand, it's uh, at Rand Fish. Yes. Most places, right? Just on uh, yep, uh, on on Twitter. I actually use I use my wife's last name on Instagram. So, oh, what? Uh, Rand Rand De Reuter. I think eventually I'm going to change my name. Oh. Um, that's but, a whole uh, other conversation. Maybe yeah, for yeah, the next time. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think I think if I understand correctly, you are going to be having Geraldine Deroyter, uh, who's my who's my wife, on uh, on the podcast as well, yes. talking about online harassment and abuse. I'm super excited to listen to that episode. Absolutely, and she's brilliant and had a wonderful talk yesterday. So I can't wait. Yeah, exciting. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. That was an awesome conversation. I was sort of got smacked most of that, you know, most of that hour. I just can't wait to try out Spark Toro personally. I'm going to keep pestering him like weekly. When, when is it coming out? When is it coming coming out? <laughs> but after having listened to uh, Lost and Founder, I do know that he probably doesn't want to rush these things. At yes, this point. no, I don't blame him. So if you enjoyed this conversation as much as we enjoyed this conversation, please do follow us and give us a positive rating on iTunes. It really helps us a lot, helps us grow, as well as follow us on Twitter at Anatomy of a Strat and Instagram. Anatomy of a Strategy. Until next week. Take care.